chapter 10, verse 8. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Their job was to stand before the Lord. First Chronicles chapter 9. So the next three passages are going to be at first and second Chronicles. Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 33. We're talking about the priesthood here. I went to chapter 19. Let me get to chapter 9. There was a 9 in it, so that's why I went there. Chapter 9 and verse 33. And these are the singers, chief of the fathers of the Levites, who remaining in the chambers were free, for they were employed in the work day and night. Day and night. The priests had responsibilities day and night in the courts of the Lord. Chapter 23 and verse 30 of Chronicles. 23 and verse 30. And we read there, and to stand every morning, this is what their job was to do, to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord and likewise at even. So two more scriptures. Second Chronicles 29. Just laying the groundwork of what the responsibility of the priests were and what the, to whom their ministry was to be directed. 29 verse 11. Page is sticking my Bible. My sons, be not negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, that you should minister unto him and burn incense. Keep in mind what we just read in Psalms. Come bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which stand by night in the house of the Lord. So one more scripture, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 35. 835. and verse 35 of Leviticus. That's what I said. 35. Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, that ye die not, for so, for so I am commanded. We'll go back to Psalm 134 again. So their job was to stand before the Lord night and day to offer incense and praise, to take care of the temple, to make sure someone was, on, was there at all times, making sure all things were always ready. And their ministry was before who? Their ministry was before the Lord. Now Matthew Henry wrote, I want to just read just a little chapter but a paragraph what Matthew Henry says about this passage of That's the 134th Psalm. He says, it's an exhortation to bless the Lord. Yeah, that's our highest calling is to bless the Lord. Our highest calling is before God. We must stir, our, stir up ourselves to give glory to God and to encourage ourselves to hope for mercy and grace from Him. It is an excellent plan to fill up our spare minutes with pious meditations and prayers and praises. Uh, no time would then be a burden, nor should we murder our hours by trifling conversation and vain amusements, or by carnal indulgences. We need desire no more to make us happy than to be blessed of the Lord. We ought to beg our spiritual blessings, not only for ourselves, but for others, not only, the Lord bless me, but the Lord bless thee, thus testifying our belief that there is enough for others as well as for us in showing our goodwill to others. That's what Matthew Henry had to say here. But uh, <clears throat> the Old Testament priest is a type 
of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. What does, what does this book of Hebrews say about Jesus' current, present ministry? He, he what? Intercedes. He intercedes. He ever liveth and maketh intercession for us. He is set down at the right hand of the Father. Uh, our highest calling is a calling that we attend unto the Lord. Why? Because he is worthy to be praised and worthy to be worshipped. It is our ministry to stand by night, to stand by day. Our hearts always poised toward God. You see, some folks, they, they, misunderstand, they misunderstand what it is to serve the Lord. I ran into a lot of people in my days in working in the church. Uh, our ministry is more than just what we do publicly. That's a very small portion of that. What Jesus did privately, alone, with the Father, affected his ministry. He said, the Father works and hitherto I work. He said, I have a commandment both what to say and to speak. Where did he get those instructions? He was a man of prayer. Often, he would separate himself from his disciples and go off into a deserted place or a lonely place and would pray. He would spend the night in prayer. It's ministry outside of the limelight, outside of the spotlight. Uh, some people crave the spotlight. I've had, you know, when, you, when people come and say, I'd like to serve the Lord in your church. Okay? And uh, it always amazes me how they begin to turn down certain things that you're offering them to do. Because they want the spotlight. Do you ever notice the kids? Do you ever watch children? I love children. Children are a, uh, a life lesson in the nature of man. Do you ever watch your kids after church on a Sunday night or on a Sunday morning and they're running around the sanctuary? Where do they always end up? Anyone know? Up on the platform. And what do they always usually end up putting in their hand? Microphone. Now it's cute because they're kids. But I've known some people that unless they have center stage, unless they have a microphone, they're not interested in serving the Lord. They may pretend to be, but they're not. You know, they want that limelight. They want that, they crave that attention. Uh, it's cute. Now there are other people that are very shy and introverted. Uh, and that's okay too. But sometimes you have to step outside of the garments of your personality to be able to serve God. The promptings of God are not restricted just to your personality type. I've met people that have been very shy, very introverted, and God has been prompting them to give a testimony or read a scripture or be used in one of the gifts, one of the three audible gifts of the Spirit. And they've told me, they said, I'm just really shy. So, you know what? Yes, yeah, sometimes you have to step outside of the garments of your personality. But the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. You become a different person. You see that with the prophets in the Old Testament. Gideon was fearful. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he became a mighty man of valor. Uh, there have been others uh, throughout church history. Very unassuming people until the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. But then there are people who feel that they have no usefulness, no purpose, no place in the kingdom of God at all. Because they're not the type of person that would take on a public ministry. I'll tell you what, those people are far more effective and can be far more effective than even those that take on a public if you do not have a private ministry, you don't have a public ministry. You don't. It's not the things that we do, it's, it's who we are that matters more than anything. Our, our ministry must be an outflow of our private time standing before the Lord. God is far more interested in what he can do in us than what he can do through us. 
because until he is able to do something in us, he is unable to do anything through us. Think about that for a moment. What does God want to do? God wants to work in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. A lot of people can spout off knowledge. Pastor and I were just talking about uh, people uh, he is associated with that have advanced degrees <clears throat> that are very, very intelligent. I just want to say this. I've known people who have had advanced degrees. They're more intelligent than anyone else. They just took the time to go get the education, go to take the courses. And, and I'm not, I don't put it in, I don't put a premium on ignorance. And, and I, I applaud their accomplishments, but it doesn't mean that they're any better than anyone else. You can have a PhD, a THD, an STM, you can have all that and still not have God. And you can have a third grade education and still not have God. It, the knowledge of God is found in the seeking of God. And ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. So the challenge is, do we know God? Do we know, you know, uh, his acts were revealed unto the children of Israel. His ways were made known unto Moses. Because Moses had a burning bush experience. Moses turned aside to see what this thing was that was happening. He turned aside to commune with God. I like Fanny Crosby's hymn, Draw Me Nearer. She has a line in that hymn about, uh, I commune, it talks about communing with Jesus, says, I commune as friend with friend. Remember in Bible school, I was perplexed by how do you become the friend of God? Now the answer is in the Bible, and it's a very simple answer, but I didn't know the Bible very well. And I was going to ask that question one Wednesday night, every once in a while, Brother Bunny had the Wednesday night services, and he that was not his regular uh, night for services, but if he did, Many times, even instead of having something to preach or teach on, he'd just say, who has a question? That's, that would be the lesson that night. People have kept feeling prompted to ask. But I know how you become the friend of God. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Abraham was obedient. He had faith and was obedient, and he was the friend of God. You want to be the friend of God? Uh, let your faith grow. How do I get my faith to grow? Faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, by the word of God. So our faith grows when we have an intimate relationship with Jesus through his word and through prayer. Now, I don't know who this person is. I guess, I guess this person is a well-known evangelist. I have no idea. I, I think I've seen this person once or twice before on social media. Uh, and I didn't read the whole article because I'm not interested. I just wasn't interested. I really, really don't care. Other than the fact that the, the, the bold headlines jumped out at me and I thought, I don't know what you're talking about. This person made the statement that spending time in God's Word is not being intimate with God. Being intimate with God was only being in prayer and I guess having a uh, goosey bumpy feely moment. I'd like to say to that person, you're, you're, you're totally out of it. You're totally wrong. That when I'm in God's word, he's communing with me as friend with friend. He speaks from his word. Amen. Thy word have I exalted above my name. And when, I, when I'm in prayer, I'm having an intimate experience with God. Now granted, you could, there are people who have memorized entire passages of scripture that had no intimacy with God. Do you know who, as a young boy, memorized much of the New Testament and a historical figure? Do you know who that was? What's that? No, no. Historical figure that this person, I guarantee you, probably is not even in heaven today. Joseph Stalin. The 
being raised at, uh, as a Russian Orthodox, a man who is responsible for probably a hundred million people's deaths, and could quote large passages of the New Testament. So not just, you know, not just dedicating yourselves to scripture memory. Anybody can do that. There's people who can recite entire passages of William Shakespeare. But it's, are we having an intimate relationship with God? And the psalm says here, Come bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which stand by night in the house of the Lord. There had to be continual praise and worship uh, being heard and incense being offered up in the house of the Lord in the Old Testament 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was the highest of callings. Now, how would you like to be the priest that got called for duty on the third shift? No one's there to see you. No one's there to observe you. Or is there? Is our ministry before people, or is it before God? And I listened to a speaker one time, probably close to 40 years ago, and he said that he had been on a mission trip by himself one summer in Egypt. One evening, he was walking down a very well-populated city, walking down a very tourist, a lot of tourists on this street. And he said, out of nowhere, a woman, an Egyptian woman, came up to him and offered her services to him. He said, there I was. No one else around me knew me. A world away was my family. A world away was my church. A world away was my district officials. A world away was anyone who knew me. Who would ever know? He said, God would know. God would know. Because our lives are lived before God. Now, are you worried about what people think about you? I don't live my life before them. But that's not a ticket to sin. I live before one who is far wiser than any human judge could ever be. I live my life before God. You see, God is so wise. His, his knowledge is, is omniscient. He knows things not only as they're happening, he knows them before they're happening. He does not need to be informed. You know, sometimes uh, when you raise kids, that, that's a great life lesson too. Two kids telling you the same thing, you don't know which one to believe. How did that lamp get broke? What do you say, Johnny? Kind of just bumped into it when you got up off the couch. Oh. Billy says you were throwing a ball up and down in the air. Which one is true? Well, you got up off the couch to catch the ball and knock the lamp down. Oh. See, God doesn't need anyone to come testify to him. God knows everything. He sees everything. And so if our lives are lived before him, our greatest ministry is before him, and we have a responsibility to continue to offer up to him praise and glory and honor. If we are kings and priests unto God, our priestly duty is to worship. Our priestly duty is to uh, praise him. Our priestly duty is to wait upon him and to be in prayer. Prayer is more than just making your petitions made known unto God, and that's an important thing. It's important to talk to God and tell God what your needs are. But some Christians never get past that stage. They never get to the place where they wait on God. 
So what does it mean to wait on God? It means to be still, to know that He is God. Is one aspect. Another aspect, it could be that, uh, the picture would be that of a servant or that of a soldier who stands at the, the door of the, court, the king's court waiting to hear if he's being beckoned to come or to go. Our hearts should always be, be poised toward God. And I used to tell people all the time, you know, people would say to me, oh, I'm just not, I have no use or purpose in this church. I have no use or purpose, and there's no purpose to my life. There's no purpose, uh, I have no purpose in my family. Yes, you do. You have a prayer for me. People often say, they hear evangelists and missionaries say, the most important support you can give to us is prayer support. They mean that. That's true. They truly do mean that. But yet, sometimes we crave wanting to, uh, wanting to be seen or wanting to do. A lot of people have what one manager I had one time called the American Idol Syndrome. I guess it shows the one. People would come and they would audition and sing to see if they could get on the show to go on to possibly become the next American Idol. You ever see some of those people who would come on there and they would sing and they, they were horrible. They sound like a dog being killed. They were just terrible. But in their mind, they thought they were good. Sometimes it's human nature to overestimate our abilities. And some people are very gifted and talented. You know what happens sometimes with some folks like that? They rely too much on their gifts and their talents and not upon the anointing. What does the scripture say that breaks the yoke? Our gifts and our talents? No, it's the anointing that breaketh the yoke. If we would capture this thought and understand this, if we truly believe that it's the anointing that breaketh the yoke, and it's what we do before God in prayer and supplication, meant more than anything else, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Before a service in Miracle Revival Church, there'd be far more praying than there would be congregating in conversation going on. A lot of conversation goes on in this building before a service starts. Amongst one another, and not before the Lord. And at times, it's great. Now, now I'm going to get in trouble. But then again, it would be the first time I got in trouble. You know, <clears throat> I've been in Spanish churches. It's not that the Spanish and Puerto Rican churches are any better. It's just I've noticed that. But I've been in their churches. You know what the first thing people do when they come in the sanctuary? What's the first thing you do? You know where they go? To the altar. There's an altar service before the worship service, followed by an altar service. If we truly believe that prayer and intercession works, we would be far more involved in it than what we are. Uh, <clears throat> I go back to uh, Jim Simola. Anybody know who Jim Simola is? Justin. Who is he, Justin? He is the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. The book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, is an unbelievable book. He wrote that book. And if you had, Pastor Jim was here today, a very humble man, and you were to ask him, what is the key to the success of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church? Today there will be four or five services throughout the day at the Brooklyn Tabernacle. The first several services, they tell their own congregation to stay home, don't come to them, let that for the the lost and the people that don't normally come to this church you know, because they're, they're lined up down the street around the corner. 
When you were to ask him, what is the success? He would tell you, it is prayer. It is prayer. When he went to that church, there was just a handful of people. He had a choice of taking that church or another church. The other church had more people, but he ended up going to this church. That's where he felt God was leading him. There was a man in that church that came to him at one time. Uh, black man, I believe it was, just to be a pastor somewhere, a preacher somewhere. And he said, can I start a prayer ministry in the church? Pastor, I just got it. It's one of those things, you know, sometimes you get so overwhelmed by so many different, you know, the larger the church, the more, more problems. That's just the way it is. That, the more responsibility, the more, the more sheep, the more, the more, more mouths you have to feed, so to speak. And he said, well, I said, yeah, just go ahead and trust him. That man started a prayer room under the sanctuary of, the, of that church. And that ministry grew. More and more people became interested in that. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, there is someone at the Brooklyn Tabernacle praying and interceding in that prayer. The International House of Prayer has had a continual praise and prayer meeting that has gone on, I don't know how long, for maybe a decade or more. And my friend, when he was out west, that's out in Kansas, I believe, Kansas City, or I don't know, somewhere, St. Louis, somewhere like that. My friend told me, he said, so when I walked into there, I said, I asked him, Tim, what's that like? Is that, is that a real deal? He said, Dave, so when I walked in there, I said, I walked in the sanctuary, he said, I felt like something was pushing me back up against the wall. He said, uh, so what we felt at Brownsville, he said, that is even far more intense there. Why is that? Because there are people that are fulfilling the 134th Psalm. 134 Psalm. They're blessing the Lord. They're standing by night and by day. The greatest times I have with God are in when I wake up in the middle of the night and I just sit there silently in his presence. Where I begin to sing and begin to worship. I used to tell people, I do not have devotions. I don't, you call them devotions if you want to. Devotions is just fulfilling, uh, in my mind, most people, devotions is just filling a religious right and duty. I read my Bible. I don't limit myself to whatever my daily Bible reading says I'm supposed but at the same time, I also don't get under condemnation if I don't hit it on any particular day. I say, well, what do you have now? I have church. I sing. I worship. I pray. I let the word speak to me. I intercede. I chant in the Lord. I chant in the spirit. And I guarantee you that a large portion of Pentecostals, people who go to Pentecostal church, have not heard anyone sing in the spirit in, in ages. Singing in the spirit. My same friend, Pastor Tim, we were in Reading. His church came to our church on a Friday night. There had been another church. I don't know how we met up with the southern church in the city of Reading. They came. And both of our churches were going back and forth. Uh, we call them sacred assemblies. And the Holy Spirit was moving very powerfully. And uh, But his church, you know, those people in his church, they, they were born, raised, Pentecostal, that church had been in existence for 75 years or better at the time. And a young uh, adult man in our church sang a tongue message. Sang a tongue message. And when he was done, the Lord moved upon me and I sang the interpretation. Tim came up to me later and he said, I really blew our people away. He said, they never heard that before. They had never heard a tongue message being sung. They never heard a tongue message interpreted with singing. I had. It wasn't anything new to me. 
So why do I say all that? It's because we've moved so far away from where we're supposed to be that we have forgotten the things of God. You want to learn to flow and move in the Spirit? Then flow and move in the Spirit. I used to tell the people that led our song service in the church as I pastor. They used to tell them when they first, when they whenever they first start leading worship for me, I tell them, I don't go up there and lead songs. What do you want me to do? I want you to go up there and worship. I want you to go up there and I want you to close your eyes and pretend there's nobody out there in the congregation. And as you're leading the worship service, I want you to worship. I want you to get lost in God. And occasionally I'd have somebody say to me, won't things get out of control? Well, oh, thank God. Thank God. Yes, that would be wonderful. I said, tell them, I'm right back here. I'll come back here, don't worry about it. I can hop in at any time, any time and take over. So if you get in over your head or you get to be feeling the Holy Spirit coming upon you and you can't function anymore and you need to fall down, roll around the floor, you go right ahead. I'm here. I can lead worship. Any born again Christian should be able to lead worship. I didn't say be able to sing. I said be able to lead worship because worship is what we do. It's our highest calling is to worship God. The Westminster Catechism. The first question in the Westminster Catechism is this. What is the chief end of man? You know what the chief end of man is? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forevermore. It's while we're glorifying God that His glory begins to transform us. Paul said, my children, he said in Galatians 4.19, my children for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So what's the purpose of our, our church? What's the purpose of our ministry? Threefold purpose. is to offer a place of worship. It's to, it's to evangelize the world. And it is to disciple the lost. And in discipling the lost, what is our chiefest end there? Is that Christ might be formed in people. Unless we're teaching people how to pray. He said, do you really need to teach how people how to pray? The disciples felt they needed to be taught how to pray. Teaching people how to pray. How to worship. How to get lost in God. How to read the Bible. How to study. Nowadays, you, you, know, you don't need this. You don't need a concordance much anymore because you can, on your phone, you can speak into it or type into it. You have a concordance right handy. But back in the days when you still had to open the, you know, strong concordance of book, I used to bring my books to Wednesday night Bible study and I would teach people how to use the strong concordance. How to look up a word, how to find a verse by looking up a word, and then how to find what that word in Greek was and what it meant. I brought my Vines Bible study books. I would bring books and teach people. I've had pastors say to me already about I'm talking about that I'm, I'm craving the move of God in services. And I just would say about how, how we had such a great move of God in Bible school. And I, umpteen times I've had pastors say to me, You have a church in Bible school. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We are, what is church then? What is it then? It should be a place where people can come and be transformed by the power of God. And that power is only going to be active when we stand before the Lord in worship and in praise, continually offering up to Him ourselves and our worship and our praise. Now then there's people that say to me, I'm dirty. I don't feel right. I just don't feel like that. Right. Get right with God. Communion. You know why communion is important? What happened when Jesus was on the Emmaus road? How many remember that story? After his resurrection, the two guys didn't know who he was. And he was going to go on. They were turning back into their house, and he was going to go on. And they said, no, 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 no. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. And they had been discussing 
the, the day's uh, events and things about the Lord. When did they when did they really see Jesus for who he is? He broke the bread. Why is communion important? Because it reveals Jesus. These are spiritual things we do. Not just the uh, religious acts. So what are we doing in church? It should be that everything that we do should be that it reveals who Jesus is. Now, I'm talking about the gifts of the Spirit real quick. I know this is, I'm throwing out you a, a buffet or a, a, you ever see those uh, dry beans called 15 beans? You ever see that? I'm giving you 15 beans. You can buy like dry beans, three beans, they're in a bag. You can buy ones that are 15 different types of beans. That's what we're going to put a bunch of beans at you this morning. Uh, but the gifts of the Spirit are nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit revealing the nature and person and work of Jesus Christ. Why are the gifts of the Spirit important in our church? And yes, there is more than the three all of them, but, and I'll be quite honest with you, this is what folks, and, and where, does that, where do these gifts come out of? They come out of our relationship with God. Now, what did Paul say? Despise thou not prophesying and forbid not to speak with tongues, right? I guarantee you there are times when people are using the gifts of the Spirit that there are others who are saying, not again. How do I know that? What people tell me that? I've known this for 40 some years. I've heard it all. I've seen it all. I don't particularly get a thrill out of being used in the gifts of the Spirit. Whenever God uses me, you know what I feel like doing right afterwards? Crawling in a hole and hiding. And don't you? Yeah, absolutely. You're there with me. Because you've opened yourself up not only to the, the flow of God's Spirit, you've opened yourself up to immediately Satan begins to attack, and you also open yourself up for public criticism. So you have to shake off the public criticism. You have to fight the devil. You have to overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. And listen, some days I suffer days for days afterwards. I do. He just beats us every sin I've ever done, every failure, I just hear it. It just screams it into my And I'm telling you, it's a spiritual battle. Why do would, why would we open ourselves up to, to that? Because we want to be obedient to the one who is obedient unto the death of the cross. So, there will always be people who don't understand what our purpose is as Christians, is that we are to stand by night in the house of the Lord. We're to lift up our hands in the sanctuary and to bless the Lord. They don't understand that. They're not there yet. Hopefully they'll get there. Remember, I've always said that the children of Isaac are despised by the children of Ishmael. Ishmael will always fight Isaac. Isaac is a type of the spiritual. Ishmael is a type of the flesh. So whether we preach or teach or prophesy or give a tongue message or use the gifts of healings or uh, dis so distinguishing of spirits. I know that King James says distinguishing doesn't matter. Distinguishing or discerning of spirits, discerning or distinguishing, no matter what we're used to, that all first must be an outflow of us having lifted up our hands in the sanctuary and have blessed the Lord. I would, can I be honest with you? I'm 57 years old. I tell them that this is work all the time. I'm 57 years old. I'm morbidly obese. I'm tired and I don't want to do this job anymore. Oh my God. But 
but I do it. I find the strength. God gives me the strength. But at this stage of my life, if you were to ask me, what would you rather do? You have a choice to, of your day's events right now. At 57, would you rather preach a sermon somewhere? Would you rather just go to a prayer meeting? I'd rather be in the prayer meeting. I'd rather be in the prayer meeting. Our ministry should be an imitation of the ministry of angels. Remember in Ezekiel, the wheel in the middle of the wheel? And one went, one came back, one came here and went back again. Our ministry should be that we constantly are standing before God in prayer and praise and worship and occasionally we are sent off to do a task. And when the task is done, what do we do? We immediately come back before the presence of God. And we have a responsibility to attend unto the presence of God and to worship Him and to offer up the sacrifices of praise. Remember, our prayers ascend up to God as incense, sweet-smelling incense unto God. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to close here. Every Christian has a calling before the Lord to minister before Him in praise, in worship, in prayer, in intercession. To stand before him in reverence and awe as we wait upon him. What did Psalm 64 say? It says, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 65, my soul, wait thou only upon God. It's not the things that we do that matter the most. It's who we are. And our greatest effectiveness is not... Not necessarily preaching to millions. It's not necessarily even teaching a Sunday school class or singing a song before people. Our greatest effectiveness is found in the prayer closet. If what we do publicly, if our preaching, our teaching, our ministry, our singing, even our black light performance, if all of that is an out having spent time in the presence of God, it will have a tremendous influence. So I tell the pastor when I sat here a few minutes ago, remember when I told you guys it's going to get me in trouble with the pilot in town? That's just what I told you. There's a sound here today. If we truly believe, truly believe that our intercession and prayer really had the effect that we say that it has. Not just in this church, but I use this church because this is where I attend. That when we hit the door of the sanctuary and we come into the house of God, we would do far more conversing with God than we would conversations going on in the pews. That you mark my word, you take, and I, it's not me, not my word, it's God's word. You, you try this for 30 days. And when you come into this sanctuary, you find a place of prayer at the altar before the service. In time, others will follow suit, whether, whether they bow their head in prayer in the pew or at the altar. But I'll tell you what, it'll, it'll revolutionize and change what happens in our services. It truly will. It truly will. If we truly believe that, people say this. I know I'm a, I'm, I'm a little weird about something. People say prayer changes things. No, it doesn't. God changes things. Uh, prayer is the answer. Jesus is the answer. I pray to Him because He is the answer. I stand by night in the house of the Lord. And where's the house of the Lord? Wherever his presence is. I have a responsibility to God to make sure that I am worshiping him and praising him. May I shake incense before his presence.
May that be the passion of my heart and not doing anything else. Other things, other duties I may have, and they may come along, but my chief duty is to attend to God and to be sure that I am offering him praise, worship, supplications, intercessions, and prayer. God never said I sought for a man to stand on the hilltop and to preach. Now he does call people to preach, and how shall they know except the preacher be sent? But he said, I sought for a man to stand where? To stand in the gap. To stand in the gap. Pick up the head. Do you know God's greatest servants are those who serve in obscurity and outside of the limelight, outside of the spotlight. There are some folks in this church that, <clears throat> that boy, if I really... I needed, I needed prayer. I'd be going to them. I hear, and you would be surprised. I hear the spirit of intercession in their prayers. Wow. You'd be surprised at who they are. Some of them are the most shyest, uninhibited, or uninhibiting people you'd ever want to meet. But what is it about them? They have the ability to touch the face, the heart, and the ears of God. I don't know what it's going to take. I talk to other Christians. I talk to people who work that are Christians. I talk to other pastors. And they just want to run their program. They just want to run their program. Well, that's okay. But I'll tell you what the greatest program is the program of intercession and worship. Our program will never get one person off dope. It'll never keep one person from committing suicide. It'll never keep one person from committing adultery. It'll never keep one person from living a life of lasciviousness. It'll never keep one self-righteous person away from the flames of hell because they thought they were okay when thus saith the Lord, they're not right with God. But I'll tell you what it will, what will do it. Who came into the world to convince the world of sin? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Oh, come bless the Lord. We used to sing that. We used to, that was a song we used to sing about. Well, come bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. And bless the Lord. Our calling say, I, there's not much I can do. Oh yeah, there is. You are a servant of the Most High God. Step into his throne room and begin to bless the Lord. And you will move heaven and hell. Let's pray. We're out of time. Father, we love you. Help us to be attentive. Help us to fulfill our duty before you in the presence of God. Help us to be servants of the Most High God who worship and pray. Day and night, night and day, may the incense of our prayers, our praise, and our worship ascend to your nostrils. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.